Bible perspective matters when we dig into language and context. Bible perspective matters. And when entered into the New Testament, jumping into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, a shift takes place. And it's no longer Bible. It's Greek, pagan, philosophical thought with the scriptures used to verify what is there written. And so we have to question where this came from. Going into the record of Mark, that very first line, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, where could this have come from? So this, this book is written post-destruction of Jerusalem. The foundation of this philosophy, of this belief, has been ongoing before this. And the author of this is none other than Paul. None other than Paul. It is Paul who has laid the groundwork for a belief that after the destruction of Jerusalem has become true and verified as being the only doctrine that should be built upon. So understanding the character of the living God's chief apostle means much because once we enter into the Greek context, we're entering into a Hellenized new Jewish religious movement and we're getting away from foundational Bible philosophy, foundational Bible thought. And so where, you know, where did Paul get this from? Our last meeting together, alluding to the three traits of character that were looked for. And Paul, growing up in Tarsus, or supposedly growing up in Tarsus, not simply just a Jew, but exposed to Greek and then everything else, culture. We have to understand that Paul is building on an already established frame. Galatians 1, 21 and 23. Galatians 1, 21 to 23. Galatians 1, 21 to 23. Galatians 1, verses 21 to 23 reads afterwards, speaking of his journey and of his change in zeal from the Jews' religion to his revelation. Afterwards, I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia and was unknown by face under the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith which once he destroyed. So when it comes to Paul, we have to understand that Paul is building on an already established frame. Paul is building on an already established frame. The framework of Paul's concept is a doctrine that already exists involving the resurrection of this main figure and involving what that resurrection means to that, to that then movement. To that then movement. This, this initial movement did not view that resurrection, that man, that, that man's ministry, the way that Paul interpreted it to be. Paul took that, took that initial movement, which was Jewish, foundational, and still stuck to it, not philosophically, for the here and for the now, nothing beyond. And Paul rearranged it and shifted it according to Greek, philosophical, religious, superstitious, pagan thought. And he did so. He did so by becoming enlightened on their leader's character. And it is this enlightenment that led him to discover many things. Paul, in his letters, 
likes to make the claim that he was not taught his gospel. True as that may be, he likes to make the claim that he was not taught his gospel. Now, his understanding may not have been something that was inherited, but Paul initially adopted a doctrine about the then existing new Jewish religious movement attributed to a certain leader. In the book of Acts, in the book of Acts 9, 17 to 19, in the book of Acts chapter 9, 17 to 19, Paul reads, and Ananias went his way and entering into the house and putting his hands on him, him, Paul, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes, as it were, scales. And he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And when he had received the meat, he was strengthened. Then was saw certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. So Paul's beginning, right? Paul's beginning was at Damascus, was at Syria, where the term Christian would later be coined, supposedly for the first time. So although Paul is saying that his, his understanding, his gospel, his revelation was not given by man, it was not received by any minister, he did not receive it from any minister. As true as that may be, in order to get to that point, Paul had to have somebody lay their hands on him. Now in the Bible, this means something. Reference this in our last meeting, but I will quote it again. Deuteronomy 34 verse 9. Deuteronomy 34 and verse 9. Deuteronomy 34 and verse 9 reads, And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom. Why? Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him. And the children of Israel hearkened unto him and did as the Lord commanded Moses. When somebody's in the Bible having another put their hands on them, it is figurative language alluding to the transference of wisdom or understanding. Paul spent his time in this other movement occurring in Damascus. Paul spent his time in this other movement occurring at Damascus and had the ministers of this movement, the Jewish ministers of this movement, lay their hands on him or transfer their understanding of the movement to him. And as soon as they did, he felt encouraged enough to do something active about it. And once he did, it was as if he had new eyes. And we have seen this term meet before. We have taken the time to strategically go through the Bible and look at what this term meet means in this context. And this term meet means doctrine. So after receiving the hands of Ananias, or after receiving the spirit of wisdom from Ananias, Paul's eyes then becoming new, he was fed meat or he was fed understanding or doctrine and continued therein until the time and as supposedly as he says in the book of Galatians he goes for 15 days to Peter and them boys at the main church now the already existing landscape that Paul is building on is a movement is a movement that already exists and that already existing movement is finding itself split. Paul didn't catch on to that initial movement because he didn't perceive the value in its leader. He didn't understand what that individual put himself through for the sake of what the living God impressed upon his heart. When Paul caught wind of this, something, something changed, something shifted.
family, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for tuning in. I want to thank you for being attentive to the message. Everything that I'm giving to you has been placed and laced onto my heart by our Father. And due to its benefit in my life, I have been inspired to share it with others. And the reactions that I'm getting have been beautiful because we're all going through the same thing. We're all going through the same thing. We're all going through the same struggle. We all got the same attitudes. We all got the same everything. But it helps to know that there is a mind that crafted a wisdom who is the creator of our human being and our conversations, conscience and body. And so, you know, taking all of this into perspective, you know, it made such an impression on me. I'm thankful to you for being attentive. And I'm thankful, thankful to you for caring also for your own um, human and devotional or spiritual condition. So I'm interrupting this meeting, a meeting in which I know you are being fed, to give a shout out to my sponsors. Uh, Grammarly, thank you. Grammarly, if you are into writing as I am, if writing is your life as writing is my life, Grammarly is the key to use to get your writing beyond par. Beyond par. It's simple to use very simple to use and it's and it's very key to getting to the point of what isn't so obvious in your writing. So if you are a writer like me, publishing, um, any any sort of blogging, anything that you do that you put out to benefit another, Grammarly is the way to go. And also the American Bible Society, Bibles.com. The American Bible Society, if you love the Bible like I do and if you need a new Bible or just would like a collection, American Bible Society, you can find everything and anything related to the Bible on this website. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Now, what stood out to Paul and what we will not know, what we will not know, but what stood out to Paul was a concept, a Greek philosophical concept, typified, typified, brought to life by, by Greek gods, was the concept of the virtuous sufferer. The concept of the virtuous sufferer, the concept of one, whether in life or in death, fulfilling the potential of their purpose. This concept, Paul latched on to, and I get it. This, this concept, Paul latched on to, because prior to this individual's, you know, resurrection and it being more than anything, in the Hebrew context, or in the context of the Bible, when one is taken by God, it is not because there is any divinity in them. It is because they have actually relinquished self to the living God's devotional character. And, they, and, and, and they've done so, so well that their God himself cannot live without them next, unless they're next to him. So in that initial movement, this is how that, that leader, that chief leader, the living God's chief apostle was seen. He was seen as David was seen. He was seen as Zerubbabel was seen. He was seen as Moses was seen, as Elijah was seen, as Elisha was seen, as Enoch was seen, as Abel was seen. He was seen as an individual profound, profound in the living God's devotional character and so loved due to him dying for the philosophy that he taught, which as we have seen. We have seen that philosophy unfolded, and it is Emmanuel. This individual died for Emmanuel. And so dying the way that he did, dying that valiantly, he was taken. Now, this is what the initial belief was, and, and that individual being taken, it ended there. It ended there. It ended there because the philosophy remained on earth. It was a figurative example for how the inward person should be acknowledging itself and its connection to the living God 
and to the individuals around it. It was a concept for regeneration of devotional thought and mind and for human thought and mind. Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me, said David in Psalm 51. And that was the essence of what that movement meant, of what that man meant to that movement. Now, adding on to that movement, the age that if we have to go back, let's go back. And the age that we are living in is a, a, a very Greek age and, and much is Hellenized. Hellenized meaning Greek literature, form of thought, philosophy, and such is with the gods, is in everything and is making everything delectable. And so when we're in this age, everything applies in the Greek context. And if it doesn't, well, it's just not modern. It's just not right. And it cannot attract. And so... Paul's attachment to this figure now. Paul is a man of the age. As well versed as he is in the scriptures, he is also well versed in Greek context and in Greek literature. And he applies that context of the Greek to that initial movement. Doing so, he arrives at the fact that this man was that man because he was the virtuous sufferer. This has been talked about by the gods and they've written of it in philosophy. And here we have a man living it. And, his so, and, and so his resurrection just can't be that. There has to be more. And Paul, Paul dug into that more. And so you come to us. Right, You come to us in the age that we're living in when we're reading these things and I can say whether academic or lay we're not really seeing the fine-tuned imprint to understand that this frame of thought that, that, that Paul took his revelation and his gospel to be from was a frame of thought that existed in the Greek context and was imprinted into the Jewish scriptures to validate both, to validate both. And, and this is not something I am just saying and making up. This is actually in the record of the Gospels. Looking at Luke 23, 46 and 47. Luke 23, 46 and 47, this concept of what Paul saw is here. Luke 23, 46 and 47, and when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, and having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now, when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, certainly, this was a righteous man. Now, with everything that took place before that, before this comment, certainly that this was a righteous man, that's not really enough to make someone say, certainly this was a righteous man. Now, we can say that the, the astronomical and the environmental may have compelled this individual to see that by killing this individual, you have harmed everything natural. And so, wow, this man was really unjustly punished. Because now look at the consequences that are happening because of his death and, of, and because of who are putting him to death, who is putting him to death. But this phrase goes deeper than that. This phrase goes deeper than that. This phrase is pointing to the virtuous sufferer. Here we have an individual, and from everything that was placed before, most likely covering up this initial thought. 
We have an individual suffering for what he taught. These added elements are added because of Paul's already established concept of this individual. So these elements are added to the narrative due to the already established context that Paul's gospel puts him in. Due to the framework that Paul is built, built upon, that Paul is building on, the new framework that he has established, these authors are putting that into this narrative and are suppressing the actual concept here, which is philosophical. This individual wasn't righteous because nature moved at his death. This man was seen to be righteous because he virtuously suffered for what he believed in. He virtuously suffered for what he believed in. And it was this that when Paul got wind of, and in the context that he should, when he, when he, when he understood that this concept was real, and in the sense of it being fulfilled in his, in, in his time, kind of. And when he, he saw what was held to that, when he understood what was said about that man, rumored, what was rumored to be said about that man, just as it was said of Joseph and Daniel, can we find one in whom the Spirit of God is? We know that the spirits of the gods are in you. Because of his profound wisdom, Paul understood that this man's death meant more. Meant more than what the initial movement thought that it was supposed to mean. And in doing so, understanding so, he, he got into it. Have a desire to take your conversation to its highest potential? If you do, hop on over to my website and check out the School of Reform. Yes, school is most definitely in. Knowing Bible is the course that I am now offering to take your conversation to its next level. Grow closer, not simply with the philosophy that is within the Bible. Grow closer, not simply with the devotional character of the living God, but grow closer with yourself also. So head on over to my website, check out the School of Reform, and check out Knowing Bible. This is the course for the learner that wants to make their life, both personal and devotional, more full. So we get everything that we can think of concerning this term Christ from Paul because it's application, the application of the term, Paul, Paul misapplied it. We can't even say that he misapplied it because in his day and age, you know, this was something natural to do. But it was unnatural because he took already existing Jewish mythology, already existing Jewish theology, and the already existing philosophy within the Bible, and he kind of rewrote it to the point now where we don't even know what, what the philosophy of the Bible is, but we only know, quote unquote, his gospel. So when we're seeing Mark in his first line, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God, this is the gospel of Paul. This is the doctrine of Paul. This is the revelation of Paul. That's the only reason that the author of the book of Mark can say this. This is not foundational philosophy within the Bible. This is not in the scriptures. This concept of the righteous sufferer, Paul took it and from there built his philosophy, saw the man to be more than what he was. Because as that righteous sufferer, as that individual with whom the spirit descended and fell upon, remember, this is Greek now. This is Greek thought that Paul is thinking, thinking in and through. In the Greek context, that uh, spirit, noma, spirit, when it falls, it seeps beyond the skin, seeps beyond the flesh, goes beyond the bones, 
and goes into what is within. The Greek context of spirit means one divinely touched. And so it is not strange at that time for an individual to be thought of as possessing, as we see in Daniel again, and in Joseph, the mind of the gods due to their profound wisdom. The living God's chief apostle spoke the wisdom of the living God, which was, again, Emmanuel. He spoke the living God's wisdom. After his death, his perception changed because the age allowed it. And so Paul catching wind of this, Paul catching wind of the rumors of the man's brilliance, Paul catching rumors of the suffering uh, servant, Paul catching rumors that the suffering servant died valiantly and virtuously. All of a sudden, the man was seen righteous in Greek context. And what was applied to the man, according to Paul, ought to be more than what the initial movement was applying to him. And so what we have is the development of a deity, of a demigod, from the perspective of Paul's gospel. Not from the perspective of Bible. From the perspective of Paul's gospel. That's why he calls it his gospel. It is his gospel because he's picking up where the initial movement did not want to venture to. And he's seeing in that initial movement's chief leader the fulfillment of the Greek context. And so he's applying mythological thought to an actual person and is developing a concept called his gospel. And in this concept, the individual must be raised from the dead. He, continuing, remember, we're continuing in the framework that's already established here with Paul. Individual must be raised because within him is that spirit, is more than man. And so knowing that there is more than man within him, God must bring him to himself and he must present his blood to God as an offering of peace to humanity. But here's, here's an issue. The, the initial deity within the scriptures and within the mythology of the Jews did not really care for humanity. Who would rather kill humanity to get his congregation established? So we have Paul bringing in a new religious concept, a new deity, a new God, and is rewriting the hidden philosophy within the scriptures and the surface philosophy above what is hidden. So I'm bringing out these concepts to show that our justification is from what is not right. Right.